Um, we're super happy to have Howard Wolfson here with us today. Howard is a leading political strategist. He has worked on numerous campaigns, including for Senate Majority Leader Chuck, Chuck Schumer and Secretary Hillary Clinton's historic campaigns for Senate and President Governor Cuomo and Mike Bloomberg. Welcome, Howard. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. We're, we're super excited and thank you for doing this. Let's win it. <laughs> Um, so we just love to start off by asking you how you think our democracy is doing right now, like what you think is working, what needs to change, and just your view being in politics. Well, it's a really good question. I think our democracy was really tested these last four years. Um, I think that uh, we made a terrible mistake in electing Donald Trump. Um, he tried to basically bust through every guardrail that uh, our democracy had put in place to protect uh, citizens from, from a president like him. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, after four years, our democracy held, but it was a, it was a pretty, it was a pretty close, close thing. Um, and I, um, so on the one hand, I'm, thrilled and excited and encouraged by the fact that Joe Biden was elected. Um, we had the largest turnout in American history uh, since 1900. So uh, we had an enormous number of people come out and vote for Joe Biden, which was really encouraging. People sort of understood the stakes. They understood what was at risk um, and they responded. Um, and I think you saw over the four year period a lot of social activism and engagement and involvement. Um, you know, beginning the day after the inauguration in 2017, where you had a million women around the country in the streets, um, and then continuing through the, um, the marches around gun safety, the marches for our lives. Uh, and then of course, all of the, um, the, the marches and rallies around Black Lives Matter. So you, you had a, a, an enormous amount of civic engagement and civic activism, uh, which was really encouraging. Um, so all that makes me feel good and hopeful. Um, what worries me though, frankly, is that, you know, we did elect Donald Trump in the first place and, and he, um, he was nearly reelected um, even after the sort of disastrous four years that we've had. So um, I think on the one hand, there's a lot to be hopeful about um, and on the other hand, there's a lot to be concerned about. And it certainly argues that for everyone who was engaged and um, in the streets and marching and protesting to stay engaged and um, continue that level of engagement uh, and involvement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and talking about elections, you were uh, Bloomberg's top advisor while he was running for president last year. We'd love to know about how that experience went and what are some things you learned about our country and our democracy throughout that process? So this was my third presidential campaign. Um, I've been in politics now, I've been involved in politics for, for a while. So this is, this is, num this was number three. Um, you know, Mike got into the race rather late um, and he got out somewhat early. <laughs> so it was not a very long campaign in that sense. Um, when I worked for uh, then Senator Clinton in 2008, that was a two-year campaign. Um, and it was the sort of the most grueling and exhausting thing that I had ever done up until that point, because two years of, of that kind of intense campaigning is, is pretty difficult. Th th this one, by comparison, I think was um, was not was not as bad uh, in that sense. Um, you know, I also we also shut our campaign down right before COVID hit, right before the lockdown. And I was I often thought, you know, what a different experience it must be like to be in a campaign during a pandemic, um, because you know, as so so much of what a campaign is is being out with people and talking to ordinary folks, everyday people, 
um, in a broad cross section of America. And it's hard to do that when you can't like shake anybody's hand or look anybody in the face. And so I give a lot of credit actually to the Biden campaign that they were able to kind of navigate uh, all of the remote activity that they had to navigate. I mean, e even when, um, you know, every campaign that I've been on uh, is set up so that everybody is in the same room or as many people as possible is in, are in the same room to create the kind of flow of information and the synergy uh, and an opportunity for people to quickly bounce ideas off of one another. Um, I don't know what it would be like to be in a campaign where you didn't have that opportunity, where everybody was isolated in their own rooms, couldn't talk to one another. Um, so I gave the I, I give the Biden campaign an awful lot of credit for navigating uh, all of that in a in a, obviously a very difficult and stressful time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that, um, like you said, you did shut off kind of right before, and so many people have used social media, and at least you know the Biden the Biden Harris campaign, just the amount of social media and getting the younger generations involved was so incredible. And then, um, you know, on January 6th, um, when the riots um, took place on Capitol Hill, that was also, you know, a moment of, I guess, kind of it, you know, I'd say it was kind of, you know, um, initiated through social media. So, um, and just talking about that, um, the riots and everything that happened on January 6th, as somebody who has spent so much time in that building and is so dialed into that scene, how did you feel when you, you know, watched everything go down and heard the news and all? I mean, I was really sort of sick to my stomach, actually. Um, I, you know, I was watching the watching the um, the debate in the chamber on TV, and I had friends who were texting me or tweeting. Uh, or, or texting me tweets, showing me tweets of, you know, the crowd was gathering, what was going on. And it, it would never have occurred to me that the security would have been so lax that um, that the Capitol could have actually been breached, stormed and breached. Mm -hmm. And I kept telling people like, just calm down, it'll be fine. You know, there's no way that, that this is going to turn bad. The Capitol Police ha will always have this in hand. And um, when the when the mob actually got into the chamber, it was just you know, it was sickening. I mean, this is a place where I'd spent a good portion of a decade of my life. Um, you know, it's a, it's a gorgeous, historic building. You know, every every nook and cranny has a bit of history in it, and um, it was it was really just profoundly upsetting uh, that such a thing w was was possible. And I think it, it it speaks a little bit to you know the the start of our conversation, which is on the one hand a lot to be hopeful about, a lot of people participating um, and, and doing the right thing. On the other hand, you know, for the first time in our history, we have our Capitol building stormed uh, and people trying to overturn an election, which, you know, again, speaks to um, the risk uh, and the peril that we face if we are not um, always vigilant um, in defending our democracy and, and defending our right to vote. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I agree completely. Um, and then switching gears a little bit, we, we would love to hear about the Daily Biscuit and how you came up with that idea and kind of what you want it to represent for people. Oh, that's nice of you to ask. So, um, you know, when Donald Trump was first elected, um, it was it was unexpected for a lot of people. It was a shock. Uh, I think I and a lot and a lot of people um, that I knew in politics fully expected Hillary Clinton to win, and so um, uh, there was an awful lot of news and information and commentary about the election that was really important for people in my business and I think just ordinary citizens to read about and reflect and try to understand what had happened. And if you believe, as I've said now a couple of times, that the the election of, of Donald Trump was essentially a fairly unhealthy thing and a, a sign that our democracy itself was in trouble. It was important to educate ourselves about why that happened and what we could do in the future to uh, prevent such a thing from happening. And so, you know, I work at the Bloomberg Philanthropies. Um, there are a lot of uh, very civic minded people who are there to make the world a better place. And I just sort of decided on a whim that I was going to 
send around um, links to some articles every day that I thought were interesting. Um, and uh, not a lot of commentary, just, you know, here are some things I think you ought to read. If you want to read them, great. If not, you know, no, no, no problem. Uh, and, and, I, and I sort of kept doing it every day. Uh, and the, the readership kind of, you know, grew and grew um, rather organically. Um, and it, it's, I, I especially actually, um, this obviously predated the pandemic by quite a bit, but especially with the pandemic, I think it was important um, an important way for, for, of staying in touch uh, with people, of sharing information, sharing ideas, making sure that um, people were well-informed. People would email me, you know, ideas for stories that I should put in. And of course I would send out the email every day, but, but the, the ways in which we are communicating with one another during the pandemic, obviously it's much harder uh, for us to stay in touch, uh, all of us. Um, and so, something like that, I think becomes even a bit more important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, you know, switch, like Layla said, we're switching gears one more time. Um, we have heard that you're deeply involved in philanthropy. And so we just want to hear what, from your perspective, the role of um, the philanthropic sector in democracy and our democracy. Right, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, you know, most other countries don't have the kind of robust philanthropic um, sector that we do. I mean, if, if you think about, um, you know, if, you, if, if people are familiar with this term civil society, you know, what makes up civil society? There's government um, and, and, uh, and then there's a, this sort of the sector of civil society that in this country, you know, philanthropies play a really big role in um, pushing initiatives, in uh, in sometimes providing an alternative to what government is doing, sometimes working with government, sometimes pushing government. Um, and uh, you know, at Bloomberg Philanthropies, we are very deeply committed to, um, you know, a deep kind of civic engagement. Uh, we're, not, we're not afraid of politics. Obviously, Mike ran for president. He's very involved in issues that, you know, are sometimes controversial, like climate change or gun safety. Um, He's not afraid to, to use his money to advocate for, um, for, for, for change, the, the kind of change that, you know, it can be controversial and um, is not easy and requires real work and resources. And so I myself head up the, um, I kind of have two hats. One is I run our education philanthropy and that's really aimed at um, trying to make sure that uh, high achieving, low income kids get to go to really great colleges, which um, when I say that everybody sort of, you know, nods their head and says, that's a great thing. Cause like, that's a great thing. Nobody can be against that. And then I also run our advocacy programs, um, uh, which basically means, you know, spending money on behalf of issues like climate change uh, on issues like gun safety, um, taking on the tobacco industry to, you know, get, um, higher um, cigarette taxes uh, or taking on the soda industry to get soda taxes. So things that, that tend to be more contentious, um, but that somebody like Mike is not afraid of and not afraid of wading in on. Um, and I'm, I consider myself really pretty lucky in the sense that I get to wake up every day and go to work and um, think that I'm actually making the world a better place, which, uh, you know, I, I just, if, if you had asked me when I was your age, what I want, what, what, what I'd want to do with my life, the ability to affect change and try to make the world a better place would have been the thing that I would have set as my career goal. I didn't know exactly how I was going to do that. And I've done, I've tried to do it in different ways at different times, but that's, you know, in some sense, that's kind of the flow through. Um, and again, gets back to this question of the strength of our democracy. You know, if you it, democracy is not a spectator sport, right? And I think for a long time, we took the strength of our democracy for granted. And, you know, maybe we voted, maybe we didn't. If we voted, we sort of showed up and did our thing and went about our business. And I think we took the safety and security and stability of the country for granted. And I think 2016 with Trump's election was a huge wake up call. I think that's why, you know, right after the, his inauguration, you get a million women in the street around the, the country. And I don't think it's any coincidence that in these last four years, you have seen a, you know, at least since the sixties anyway, a kind of an unprecedented 
number of people in the street practicing you know, democracy, um, educating themselves, being engaged, sharing information with others, marching on behalf of causes, giving money on behalf of causes. Um, and, uh, you know, it just, everyone, um, everyone is able to participate at their own level. There are people who are busy, they're raising kids, they're not able to go off and march. Not everybody's able to give money. Um, you know, people sort of find their way into this kind of dem democratic spirit. But I think on some level as citizens, you know, we all have a bit of an obligation to at least vote, vote in an educated way, participate, educate. And then if you're able to do those things in a deeper way, march, give money, um, advocate, protest, that sort of thing. Uh, I mean, I sort of, as you can tell, I kind of take all this fairly seriously. And I think 2016 is what happens when people don't take it as seriously. And I think 2020 is what happens when people wake up <laughs> and recognize that they've got to be out there, um, you know, with their wallets, with their bodies, with their minds, fully engaged. Um, you know, democracy just, it's not something that other people are in charge of. Um, we're in charge of the, uh, we collectively are in charge of this country. And um, if we're not stepping into the arena and trying to make a difference, um, things don't go well. Mm -hmm. And how can people help specifically with Bloomberg Philanthropies, people all around the world who want to make change? So, it, you know, the Mike is a major funder of Every Town for Gun Safety. Um, he's certainly not the only funder. It's got a lot of grassroots mm -hmm. uh, members. It's got a lot of people who give money in, you know, five, 10, 15, $25 denominations. Um, it's, it's got, you know, millions of moms uh, across the country who are members of Moms Demand Action. Um, but I would say, you know, um, of all of the issues that we work on, uh, that's probably the one that has the, the most robust um, uh, grassroots uh, organization and um, is deeply engaged in politics and advocacy, both at the local level, the state level, the federal level. Um, and if, you know, making our streets and our society safer from gun violence is something that animates you or interests you or think you think it's an issue that you care about, that would be um, a place where, you know, they could use your, your voice and your participation. Um, so Moms Demand Action in Every Town for Gun Safety uh, would, be the, would be the recommendation, I think, that I would offer. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Howard, for your time and being here. Thanks. With you. We're honored to get to spoken with you. And now that we're done talking, let's go take action. So um, check out the Daily Biscuit and please, please, please go to everytown.org, like you said, and just look into every, every town for gun safety and all that they do and moms demand and students demand. And there's so many ways to get involved are and um yeah they've just done so much incredible things for America. well thank you thank you guys for you know raising these issues and focusing on democracy uh you know it's again it's just you know we, we take it for granted when things are good and then if you take something that's good for granted sometimes it goes bad and uh now's the time where everybody's got to dig in and really uh get back out there and, and do what you can to make our country and the world a better place. So thanks for the conversation. Thank you. Awesome. Well, it was so great meeting you.